with our first speaker, who is uh, Dan Miller. He's going to talk about soil type and short-term survival of porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. Do you want that little bit? I just put it down. Thank you for the, the introduction. Um, I'd like to recognize my uh, collaborators on this project before I get into it. Um, <clears throat> a program like this usually requires a lot of uh, varied uh, uh, expertise. And so Sarah and Dustin uh, are both uh, with the University of Nebraska, the vet department. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, vet college, I should say. And Aaron uh, it was a graduate student with Amy Schmidt in the engineering group. And of course, I'm with actually USBA. So um, all of us got together and decided to uh, write a grant, try and get some uh, funding and some information about porcine epidem epidemic diarrhea virus. Hard to say in one mouthful, so I'll, I'll call it PEDV from here out, just because it is such a, a mouthful. Um, Viruses, I don't normally think of those as, as emerging uh, issues or, or infections because we've been dealing with viruses for a very long time, uh, since the dawn of animal husbandry. Um, but we, the thing about viruses is uh, they, come and, they come and go. So, uh, you know, what might be uh, something new, say, five years ago, is suddenly the latest news. And uh, the new news, of course, is African swine fever. So uh, kind of as you, you get in this field, uh, things kind of come and go. Um, so a little bit of background about uh, PEDB. First appeared in the U.S. in 2013, spread among pigs via fecal oral route, uh, severe diarrhea, vomiting, um, nearly 100% mortality in the pre-weaned pre pigs. So these little guys don't fare very well. Older pigs uh, suffer performance losses, but usually you can you can weather them through the through the uh, the worst of the, the viral um, issues and uh, kind of continue on with them. But uh, if this hits like a sow operation, uh, you're just in trouble. Annual impact uh, this was back in 2014 was estimated at about eight billion. It's probably a, a quite a bit less now. Uh, we still get waves of PEDB outbreak. Uh, seems like uh, late in the uh, uh, winter, early spring, you see a, an onset of, of uh, locations that come down. They, they come down with the disease, they clean them up, and they kind of go away. But every year, we still seem to get this cycle. Over time, the cycle has been diminishing a little bit as people become, I think, more honestly proficient with uh, biosecurity and keeping, keeping the virus out. So how do producers deal with the uh, PEDV outbreak? Uh, like I said, vigilant biosecurity is the best defense, and this applies to all, uh, you know, viruses and other diseases in uh, animal production settings. Uh, particularly when it hits, they depopulate, and the cows develop, or the sows develop their uh, immunity. Um, then any new piglets that come along have uh, the immunity passed from their mother to them. Uh, typically, they have to clean and sanitize all those swine production areas, so you know. The walls get clean, the uh, ceilings get clean, the animals are all out of there, everything gets scrubbed, and within a few days they bring animals back in and try and get, get going again. One of the questions we had uh, was when we got into this research topic was, you know, what do we do with the manure? So there's a large volume of manure underneath these, these animals here, deep pits, all hot with virus. So uh, Questions are, how long does it hang around in this uh, manure? Uh, is it still infected? Do we need to pump out the pits? You know, when, when we do pump out the pits, what happens to this? Um, a lot of questions, a lot of producers were uh, 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 having a lot of fear and angst about how to handle uh, manure and cleanup in general. So. Manure treatment, this uh, is probably a bit of a review for, for a lot of folks here, but there's two types. Basically, uh, you got a deep pit underneath the house, so this is what would be underneath that uh, previous picture. There'd be a deep pit full of manure, or it uh, usually gets uh, flushed out and held in some sort of a lagoon or some other treatment. Of course, uh, eventually, everything ends up back on the soil, 
because you want to reuse the, the nutrients in crop production. Question again, of course, is how long does that virus persist in soil? What happens to the virus in the manure? Uh, we can learn some lessons and then get some ideas from how uh, human biosolids are handled. Typically, uh, there'll be an alkaline stabilization of the manure, so they add, uh, oops, let's go back, some sort of uh, quick lime, calcium hydroxide, something that brings the uh, pH of the biosolids up to around 12 for about 30 minutes. It's a very affordable treatment and it basically gets rid of the pathogen. That's how they treat a lot of the biosolids from human, human waste. So how would PEDV respond to uh, alkali treatment? We did an initial study, uh, and this has been published I think in the name of the journal. Uh, it's a vet, veterinary journal. I, I can get that to you if you have a question about it. Um, but this was published where we added increasing amounts of lime and we looked at the presence of the uh, PED virus. And this is the virus <coughs> over here. This is a log scale. So 10 to the 9th would be uh, more than a billion um, PEDV particles or, or genomes actually per gram in this manure slurry. So we added a little bit of uh, alk uh, the uh, uh, lime to increase the pH. And uh, you can see that the, the pH goes up here on this axis. And right around pH 10, we saw that the uh, PED virus, PEDV virus, uh, would uh, suddenly start to decrease. So, um, that's a pretty good sign. It looks like it's behaving similarly to what we'd see with human biosolids. Get the pH up, you probably are knocking out the virus. It doesn't necessarily tell us whether the virus is still infective or not. So to take that next step, we did a, a swine bioassay. So we took a little bit of that treated manure and we uh, exposed it to piglets. In the, and this is what the vet college folks were helping us with because they had the, the correct biosafety labs to be able to conduct the experiment. So you expose them to this virus and then you look for signs of the virus. They can either get, uh, you can see the, the piglets get sick. Uh, once they get sick, of course, they're euthanized and then we collect a bunch of samples to see if the virus is, is there and whether it's uh, causing the disease. So here's the quick lime, the, the hydrated lime that we added. This is the amount, grams per liter. You can see that the pH, of course, went up. This is basically samples from that previous slide. And if we looked at PEDV, and the way we were doing this, I should take a, a moment to explain that. Uh, you would take a sample of manure slurry, you would freeze it, you would extract the RNA from that manure slurry, and then you'd go in with a special molecular detection, PCR-based uh, detection, to see if you could find the sequences specific for PEDV virus. And then you can uh, quantify that using quantitative PCR. So it's, it's this really complicated molecular way of counting how many uh, PEDV uh, targets were there in the initial sample. So once again, you can see that here we had uh, 10 to the ninth organisms. Uh, basically about, about pH 10, we started to see a drop and then drop quite a bit at pH 11. When we exposed this material to the piglets, uh, we looked for a couple of, of, of signs that they were um, being infected. One is uh, uh, immunohistochemistry, which is looking using an antibody to detect the virus. And then the other one is this, this rectal swab CQ. It's basically the same thing that we were doing with the PCR. We were using PCR to try and detect those viruses. The big uh, take home message here as pH 10, none of the samples were positive either uh, immunologically or by PCR with uh, the virus. These pigs were all fine. Some of these pigs uh, got sick. So there seems to be uh, consistent with what we would expect, raise the pH up to about 10, the virus dies. It can no longer be infected. So what we learned was experiments indicate that there is some ammonia loss if you raise the pH of manure slurry. You want to retain your nitrogen. 
suddenly it's all in that ammonia form and it can volatilize and, and uh, suddenly your manure is not worth as much uh, based on the nitrogen content. So using that, we would uh, kind of espouse that you would maybe do this as you load up your tanker truck. You put in your, your lime, you get the pH up, you lock down your tanker truck, then you take it to the field, it gets all nice and mixed, and then gets applied in the field. Uh, if you try to do this, say, in, a, in an open house, it could be a real uh, worker safety issue where suddenly uh, the house fills with ammonia um, and it could, could cause uh, some, some problems. Um, so the question is, is, is what happens to PDV if you decide not to use uh, like this hydrated lime? A lot of folks don't use hydrated lime to treat the manure. It is an extra step. Um, soils are kind of a natural barrier out there, a natural kind of sponge to, that handles viruses over time. The question is, is how long would PDV hang around in the soil? So to answer that question, the, the fate uh, a PDV in soils, we want to make sure that we don't, say, clean up our barns <laughs> and we have the field full of PDV, run the tractor through the fields and it comes back to the barns and suddenly you have an outbreak again. A lot of factors in the soil can positively affect whether viruses persist or go away. And you can see these are different biological, chemical, and physical factors. Sunlight, if you say you were uh, applying to the surface, you'd have sunlight. But a lot of this manure gets put under the under the ground. What's a safe amount of time for soil to naturally deactivate the virus? And how does PEDV persistence change with, say, different soils? There's a lot of different soils out there. So this is a little uh, micrograph of what the virus looks like. It has these little, little uh, blobs on the outside of it. If you take a look at the, the virus itself, it has an envelope, like a, like a, a, a cell uh, lipid layer. And these things are called spike proteins. They're glycoproteins, so there's protein and sugar kind of attached there. These things are critical for attaching the virus to the cells that, that uh, get infected in the pig. So one can imagine if we mess around with these things, say make the pH too high, these things don't fold right, suddenly it's no longer infected. And that may explain why it, it isn't infected. So a lot of things, say, in the soil say uh, an extracellular enzyme that might come in and start chopping up these things, that would be good for us because it would make the particle less infective or not infective at all. The experiment we set up, we did uh, seven soils with a range of different characteristics and you can take a look at this you know, uh, later on, but basically we wanted to get a, w a wide variety of different things like pH we knew could be important not as big a range as I would have liked, but we're still going from 7, 6 to 6, so slightly alkali, acidic soils. Um, what we did is we took triplicate samples from a nearby outbreak, so this was really fresh from a site in Nebraska, and uh, did a lab incubation. So we diluted that fresh feces that was really hot in PDV, and then mixed it with soil and incubated it at 15 degrees Celsius, and then over a period of time, we'd collect samples, freeze it, and then later on we'd extract that RNA, and we would uh, look at uh, PEDV genomes in there. And then we would go in and we'd look at the infectivity. We would do that swine bioassay again. So this is looking at the RT-QPCR detection. That's that molecular detection, okay? And uh, we can see that there's some real big differences depending upon the types of soils. And I'll get back to this so we can match up with what may be happening in the soils. But the take home message here is you have some where there's only a couple log decrease. So that's uh, decreasing from around 100 million particles or uh, genomes per gram <coughs> to around a million. So, you, so it's a pretty decent decrease. Here, some of these decrease very quickly. Um, we know that it only takes I think it's 10, 10 particles or, or, or less to infect an animal. So that's that would be down here where there'd be a one. And unfortunately, my assay could not get that low. But uh, we do know that uh, we would use, uh, using these samples, we went in and took 24-hour uh, samples, 
and 48 hour samples and use those in the, the pig bioassay. And so we could kind of go in saying, well, these still have some particles there, so these might be infective, while maybe these guys down here are not no longer infective. That was our initial thought. Um, we did this uh, oral gavage where we used uh, the manure with uh, soil mixture, buffered and gave that to the animals, and then we looked for uh, the presence of uh, disease in those animals. And so here are the 24-hour samples and the 48-hour samples, and here are the soil manure slurry composites. And sure enough, you know, some things were negative and they stayed negative. Other things were positive and stayed positive. Uh, here you got a really wonky one where it was negative and then it was positive again. So that could have just been random luck of the draw. Of we took a little bit of this manure and the first time around there wasn't enough virus there, but the second time around maybe we hit a hot spot in the virus. So what does this all relate back to? So if we look at these samples and try and interpret this, it's not very clean. It doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So soil one and two died out here at 24 hours. We can no longer detect it here. You can see soil one, well, according to this, still had positive uh, virus in it. Even out at 48 hours, it was still positive. Number two was positive at 24 hours when we thought it'd be clean, but it, by 48, it did go negative. Uh, number three, which is one of these wonky ones here in the middle, it was negative even though you could see things there. Uh, and similarly, look at this guy out here. These are the ones that we thought those for sure would still have infected particles in it. One was negative and one was positive. So it wasn't making a whole lot of sense. There's some reasons why it could be doing this. Uh, there's a disconnection between that molecular detection and between the, in, the infectious particles. One is that you could still have it be positive by PCR but not infectious because you damaged the outer membrane. The RNA is still inside but you've damaged those, those spike proteins, so it can no longer be infected. So you can still detect it molecularly, but um, it won't cause disease. Here it could be negative, but still infectious, basically because it fell below our level of detection. If you only need 10 virus particles to cause the, the disease, and I can only measure at 100, you can still have a few of these things around. Um, the important thing, I think, to take from this is the bioassay is the gold standard. Right now, if you, if you think you're coming down with the virus and they send out a sample to get analyzed, it'll be analyzed using the PCR method. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. If it comes back negative and you still think your animals are dying, you probably have it. Um, if it comes back positive, then usually it is positive. So. so how does this relate to the soil? That was the big question. Um, you could take a, you know several hours, like I have stared at this for several hours, trying to pull things out. There's some statistical stuff that I still need to do on this data set, but one thing that does kind of come out is um, the ones that are high in phosphorus are the ones that are still positive here at the end, which is kind of weird. You know, um, it's likely a combination of things that really de determine whether it's alive or dead. Um, and phosphorus is one of those things that doesn't make much sense. Um, and in fact, kind of goes counter to what, what has been published in the past with virus. Um, so summary of future directions. The PDB, first of all, it doesn't last long in soil. You can see after 48 hours, it was gone. We'd done an early experiment where we did it at 30 days thinking, oh, there might still be PDB around. There was nothing in those samples. So that's a good that's a good thing to know, that it doesn't last long in soil. PCR is a quick way of measuring to see if it's there, but the bioassay is the best. It's the gold standard. Uh, quickest inactivation in high pH soils. Of course, manure has high, pho high phosphorus in it. Why didn't that work? You know, it, it just doesn't make much sense. I think what does maybe make sense and is something we didn't measure was I think we need to look at soil enzymes because if you have high biological activity in soils, you're going to be starting to chew up that virus as soon as it gets in the soil. And um, I think I can still go back to some of these samples and analyze to see what kind of uh, enzymatic activity is in those soils. And that might make more sense as to what's positive and causes disease and what's negative and doesn't cause disease. So um, alkali manure treatment is still the best option to control the virus. So that should be something that folks use.
like to acknowledge a lot of funding went into this project. This is over a period of several years that we, we did a number of these studies, and hopefully we'll get this published very soon. I'd also like to recognize uh, Ryan McGee and Jackie Humrick, who were in my uh, lab and helped with a lot of this work. So I'm not sure if we have any time for questions. I know I'm right up against the wall. We probably have time for one quick question. While we it's got to be a good one, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Have you looked at the interactions of fumic acids from soil and inhibition of PCR yet? No. Um, well, let me, let, me, let me go back on that. Yes. <laughs> um, I was too quick to answer as I could. Um, we did a series of studies where we'd spike in um, the uh, PEDB from a culture, from a tissue culture into soils to make sure we, we weren't getting uh, uh, too much inhibition because humic acids are a big deal and we had to go through several different ways of, of extracting RNA until we got something that really worked. But we always had positive and negative controls to make sure that it wasn't affecting the results we saw. So, so yeah, humics are, are bare, and you just got to watch out for them.